This will be a warning. But I have a pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the morning tech, Professor Dr. Kurt Ramon Novak from Impan, and he will uh, talk on the computing of homology uh, with the bias semi defined programs. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers uh, for the invitation uh, to this uh, excellent conference. Uh, so I would like to speak about um, um, cohomology of groups and uh, uh, computing uh, this cohomology in certain cases. Uh, so uh, just a brief reminder. Uh, so I'll start with a gentle introduction or a survey of a uh, property called property T, which I will be interested in. Uh, so the setup uh, in general will be that of uh, locally compact groups, but more specifically, uh, discrete finally generated groups. So uh, of particular interest, uh, interest will be uh, groups given by uh, uh, finite presentations. Uh, so you can see examples here, uh, but also lattices in, in uh, in uh, a certain topological groups, so lattices and Lie groups like SLN uh, uh, Z sitting in SLN R. Okay, so these are just some examples that will be of interest here. So the property of groups that I will be interested in is uh, called property T, and it's a rigidity property uh, for groups. So here is the definition. So, so property T has a lot of different characterizations, and this is one of the reasons why it's a very useful and powerful property. Uh, and here's the one that requires the least, uh, the least technicality. So a group has property T if whenever it acts by a fine isometries on a Hilbert space, there is a fixed point. Okay, so uh, right away, this, this, uh, this is the same as saying that the first cohomology of the group with coefficients in a unitary representation vanishes. Uh, coefficients in a unitary representation, I mean, you take uh, a G module consisting of a Hilbert space with the G module structure given by this representation. Okay, and this is, this is immediate because uh, one co-cycles uh, for such G modules uh, uh, are exactly affine isometric actions and, and co-boundaries are exactly the actions that have a fixed point. So this is, this is very easy. Once you write it, uh, it's too modest to, to notice this. Okay, so here are some examples of groups that do not have this property. So most groups will not have this problem. So here's Z acts on R by translations. There's no fixed points. There's no property T. The same works for all finally generated abelian groups. And another example is that, um, uh, that of the free group, which acts on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, uh, roughly speaking in such a manner that whenever you extend a word by the next letter, you shift by one in the new direction, you have infinitely many of those, so there's no problem. Okay, so, so both of these do not have um, property T. So this property was introduced by uh, Kajdan. So I'll, I'll give some examples uh, 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 shortly. Um, so property T was introduced by Kajdan in 1967. And originally he used a different definition, uh, which is uh, which is the following. So he looked at the 
uh, space, uh, which is called the unitary dual. So this is uh, the space of equivalence classes of reducible unitary representations. There is a certain topology on it, which is called the Feld topology. And uh, the property is defined in terms of the trivial representation being an isolated point. Okay, and he proved, uh, he gave the first example and he said, uh, he proved that SLNR and in particular lattices uh, in SLNR, so SLNZ, uh, and in general, higher rank lattices um, and higher rank Lie groups. Uh, so, so for here for n greater or equal to three, that these have uh, property T, right? So starting from SL3, uh, these groups have property T. Um, SL2, uh, SL2 does not have property T, which is, which is again easy to, to see because SL2 has a finite index subgroup, uh, which is free. Uh, and property T passes through uh, finite index subgroups. Okay, so why should we care about this property? Uh, so so the, the, one of the most important motivations are expander graphs. So, so what are these graphs? So consider a, a finite graph. Um, and uh, what I can look at is, um, is uh, for any, subset of the vertex set, I can look at uh, its edge boundary, okay? So these are all the edges that connect uh, my, uh, the vertices in my sets to the complements, okay? So if this is my set, then this will be the, uh, the edge boundary. Uh, so this is of course motivated, uh, um, right. uh, so yeah, so so there is a notion of the Cheeger constant, which which is motivated by uh, a, a similar notion coming from uh, from manifolds, uh, and this is a, this is a constant which uh, measures so you so you minimize this the the ratio of the size of the boundary relative to the size of the set. Okay, so so basically, what's the smallest boundary in your uh, what, what are you're looking for for the smallest ratio of the size of the boundary to the size of the set um, for, uh, in, in such a graph? So, so this is a measure, and sometimes it's actually called algebraic connectivity, but it measures how connected the graph is, right? So how, how uh, for any given set, how large is the, the set of edges that connects it to, to the complement? Okay, so this is, of course, this is a positive constant for any finite graph. However, what we are interested in when we're talking about expanders is in an fi infinite family of finite graphs. And what we would like to have is that this number for all of these is uniformly bounded away for, uh, from zero. Okay, so if you're looking for graphs that, that um, that are highly connected, then of course, complete graphs on n vertices are, are, are such examples. The problem here, of course, is uh, that the degree grows. So what we would like to have is we would like to have families of graphs with large connectivity, but bounded uh, degree. Okay, so this is, these are, this is what expanders are. So informally, so these are families of, of increasingly larger graphs of bounded degree in which all sets have uniformly large boundaries. And here's the definition, uh, a formal definition. So these Cheeger constants have to be greater uh, than equal than some uniform constant, positive uniform uh, constant C. The degrees are uniformly bounded and the number of vertices grows to infinity. Okay, so why 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 uh, these graphs are useful? Why are these graphs useful? So first of all, the obvious uh, thing is that they are useful for designing any kind of a, a robust network, right? So whether it's a, a computer network or a, a, I don't know some some logistic um, um, uh, plan or wh whatever whatever uh, kind of network you need. Uh, these have a lot of good properties. So it's, it's difficult to, uh, th these graphs have, uh, have the property that it's difficult to disconnect them, right? They, they are highly connected and yet at every vertex you, you limit the number of, of connections. Uh, so this is one um, obvious uh, 
um, application. There are, there are many applications in theoretical computer science. So here is a, here is a, a screenshot from Twitter. Uh, this is taken 18 minutes uh, after the, I think it was the first Royal Baby was announced. And uh, Twitter has this feature on the side here, which is called trends. So it shows you what it's trending. So the, uh, the algorithm that's responsible for creating this, these trends is called the streaming algorithm. And the way that these streaming algorithms work is that they, they look at a large stream of data. Okay, and they, 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 it's sort of a gate through which the stream passes and, and each piece of data is, is uh, seen only once. And based on this, the algorithm is supposed to pick up what's important, okay? So as you can imagine, uh, so Twitter has to do this uh, uh, in real time. And uh, you can imagine that, uh, that this stream of data is enormous, right? So every second there are uh, millions, if not more uh, words that pass through this, uh, through this uh, algorithm. And so, uh, so one application of expanders that you can, um, that you, that, that, that exist is that uh, the, the fastest or the optimal uh, algorithms uh, for doing this, so the streaming algorithms are actually done, uh, uh, designed using expanders. So, um, so this, this, is a, this is an article about this from the Quanta uh, magazine. The idea is uh, roughly speaking that, uh, that, that you chop up the, the words that appear um, into smaller pieces and then use expanders to reconnect them. All right, so so this is um, this is why you would um, uh, care about these uh, these graphs. Um, however, the, the problem is that the, they are difficult to construct. So their existence was known since the fifties, uh, and uh, it was uh, an open problem how to actually give an explicit construction. And there was a theorem in nineteen seventy seven by Margulis. Uh, who noticed that if you take a finitely generated group with property T, uh, and if you assume it is residually finite, so there exists a sequence of finite index normal subgroups in it that are getting less and less dense in a way. So the indices grow, uh, of these, the, the indices of these subgroups grow, and then the, uh, the intersection is trivial. And if you take the sequence of Cayley graphs of the quotients, then these form a sequence of expanders, okay? And the reason for this is exactly property T. So the, the fact that, that the group G has property T is responsible for, for the fact that these are expanders. Okay, so if you want an explicit example now, you take SL3Z and you take uh, the, the subgroups SL3, a pi z where p is a prime and the Cayley graphs of the quotients these are just matrix matrix groups uh, so these these are uh, these are your explicit examples of expanders okay so there are some other applications which are uh, purely theoretical I'll, I'll list a couple of a uh, few of them uh, so one is uh, uh, local rigidity theorem due to David Fisher and Margulis. Uh, so they showed, um, maybe I should say that in general, whenever a group has property T, it implies, property T implies uh, various rigidity statements for objects associated to the group. So for group actions or group algebras or things like that. So here is an example. So this is a local rigidity theorem as it is called. And you start with a group that has property T, it acts smoothly on a smooth manifold. And then you take an action on the same manifold that's also smooth, that's uh, of the same group that's close to it, to the original one. If it's sufficiently close, they're actu they actually have to be conjugate. Okay, so this is a very strong uh, statement. <clears throat> and uh, the reason for it is property. The, the second application is to baum kahn type conjectures. So baum kahn um, the baum kahn conjecture, whenever it's uh, true, it's a, it's a vast uh, generalization of the Atiyah Singer index theorem. And uh, uh, I won't uh, state uh, uh, the, the, uh, 
the formulation uh, here, the, 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 the index map. So it's a certain index uh, map from the K homology of a certain classifying space to the K theory of a certain uh, uh, C star algebra associated to the group. Uh, and uh, and so, so there are counterexamples. The, the conjecture is still open, but there are counterexamples to certain versions of, the, of this conjecture. And the only reason for these, uh, the only source of these counterexamples is again property T, because once you have property T, you can construct certain projections and certain C star algebras. Projections uh, are non commutative bundles. So they give rise to K3 classes. And these, uh, these K3 classes tend to not lie in the image of the appropriate long con assembly map, while the, the conjecture would imply the the, the map should be surjective. So this is how you how you can do this. And then there is also a rigidity um, uh, program for operator algebras. And this was started by uh, Alain Kohn, but really it took off with results of Sorin Popa. And uh, so basically you, you start with the group ring uh, or the group algebra. You complete it to a von Neumann algebra. So you close it in the, in the weak topology in B of H uh, in the operators on the Hilbert space. You get a von Neumann algebra and you ask how much of the group does the von Neumann algebra remember? So if two, uh, two algebras are isomorphic, are the groups isomorphic and so on. Okay, so this is, um, so this is, uh, 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 so again, uh, in, in this uh, setting, uh, property T uh, is crucial for proving these results. Okay, so what are, so once we know why is this property interesting, uh, what are examples of groups that have this property? So there's not that many. And it's usually difficult to show that, uh, that uh, a group has property T. So finite groups have property T, this is easy to see. Right, so if I have, uh, uh, it's easy to see from the first definition I gave. So we, with the cohomology, with the affine actions, because once you have an affine action by isometries of a finite group, you can average uh, the action or the orbit, and that's your fixed point. Um, and then there are three, uh, essentially three classes of infinite groups with property T. So, so in a way. Property T is a form of compactness for the group in the in the right setting, right? Uh, so that that's why finite groups having it are, are sort of, even though it's trivial, it should be seen as some sort of motivation. Uh, so the classical examples are the high rank simple lead groups and their lattices uh, due to Kajdan originally. Uh, then in the middle of the '90s, um, there was a new method. Um, oh, maybe I should say that. Uh, so what Kajdan uses is the algebraic structure of the Lie group together with the knowledge of the representation theory of the Lie group. Because in, the, in those cases, you actually do know a little bit more about both, both the structure of the group and, and the representation. So that's what he used. Uh, then in, this, in the middle of the 90s, there was a, a second wave of uh, examples. And these are automorphism groups of certain buildings, so-called thick buildings. So buildings are simplicial complexes, which have a lot of uh, high dimensional branching. Okay, so um, uh, for instance, these A2 tilde buildings, you can visualize them as, as uh, planes uh, triangulated and, and every edge you have another triangle and a, another plane sticking out uh, and, and you continue this uh, uh, to infinity. Uh, so, so there was another method, so called spectral geometric method that was used to prove that these uh, groups, the automorphism groups of these simplicial complexes uh, have property T. And then there, is, uh, there are certain um, random groups. So, so Gromov came up with a model in which you can say what, uh, what is a random group. So you, you choose uh, uh, generators or relations, uh, well, in general, re relations at random, and then it gives you a model of, uh, of uh, what one can call a random group, and then you can measure which properties are satisfied with, with what kind of probability. And uh, there, so in Gromov's model, uh, some of these groups, depending on the parameter, um, the parameters involved in that model, uh, they do also have property T. 
Okay, so what I would like to discuss is a new family of groups with property T and a new method of proving it. And the method will involve semi-definite programming. So uh, the, the family of groups I'll be interested in is the, the family of automorphism groups of free groups. So you start with the free group on n generators. Odd Fn will be the group of automorphisms of Fn, so all isomorphisms from Fn to Fn. And the inner ones are the ones given by conjugating by a fixed element. And then there are also the outer automorphism groups, the uh, outer automorphisms. Uh, so this is the out Fn, which is odd Fn divided by all the inners. Okay, so uh, it turns out that the there is a there is a in geometric group theory there is a certain uh, uh, setting or or uh, an uh, an analogy between three classes of groups and this is a a, a very influential analogy that that uh, that people use to study uh, two of these families or uh, so so uh, so basically we have uh, mapping class groups of surfaces, uh, linear groups, and these outer automorphism groups uh, of free groups. Uh, and uh, these three uh, classes are thought of as being similar. And the reason for this is this isomorphism, uh, isomorphism that happens for n equal to two. So out of two is the same as GL2Z, which is the same as the mapping class group of, of the torus. Okay, so the, uh, the, a, a very important uh, theme in geometric group theory is to take certain results that are classical for linear groups. Uh, for instance, the Titz alternative or something similarly uh, important. And uh, so we know that that is true for linear groups and then try to prove it for either out of two, uh, out of n, odd of n, or mapping class groups, okay? So this was this was uh, uh, th this is uh, uh, this this analogy is responsible for a lot of results, um, and it's it's quite influential. And uh, an actual question in this setting that's uh, been open for a while is: Do out of n or out of n have property T? Uh, the same question uh, applies to mapping class groups, but I, I at this point nothing is known about that. Okay, so the, the answer is, uh, uh, so, so in the case of SLNs, um, it was, uh, uh, it, the property starts with n equal to three. So it's, there's, there's a certain uh, point at which there is a transition. Right? So, so uh, here it was known for a, for a long time, but also for low indices, nothing, uh, nothing similar to property T could be true. The first, uh, for, for n equal to two, uh, odd F2 surjects onto out of two and out of two is GL2Z. Uh, property T passes on to quotients, which is easy to prove. Uh, and um, we, we know that GL2Z does not have property T. So the, here it was negative and it was also negative for N equal to three. Uh, and this was a theorem of McCool in a completely different uh, uh, setting, so he was just computing uh, homology, and he showed that the uh, homology, the first homology of odd of three, is non-trivial. Um, so it has uh, infinite abelianization, uh, and that implies there is no property. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so the the higher cases were all open. Uh, at least since the early nineties, which uh, in which which is the first uh, time I I, I think uh, this appeared in print. So this was in Alex Lubotsky's uh, uh, book from ninety four. I think he he mentioned this as a as an open question. So the theorems that I'd like to present are um, answers to this problem. So the first one is with Marek Kaluba and. Takaozawa, odd of five has property T. So this was the starting point. And then with Marek and David Kielak, uh, we proved that odd of n has property T for n greater or equal than six. 
Okay, so so let's uh, let me try to explain the how how does this work. So the the first important thing is that we will work with a certain subgroup uh, of autofan, which is the subgroup generated by Nielsen transformation. So this is the special automorphism group uh, of uh, Fn, and the Nielsen transformations uh, are written here explicitly. So uh, they are. Um, <clears throat> indexed by i and j, and it's multiplication uh, by uh, an appropriate uh, fixed uh, generator, either on the left or on the right, uh, with, uh, with either uh, uh, in, in positive or, or uh, either by the generator or by its inverse. Okay, uh, and... Um, and uh, the way that one should think about these is these are the non-commutative versions of row and column operations, okay? Because there is an, another equivalent uh, uh, definition, which is, uh, which is as follows. So we have uh, the map from the free group to uh, Z to the power N. This is just the abelianization, which induces a map from out of N to GLN. And then inside here, I have a copy of Z, uh, SLN. And the, the subgroup I'm looking at is the pre-image of SLN under this map. Okay, so this is a, a what's important is that this subgroup uh, has index two in order of n. And uh, as I said, property T passes through finite index subgroups. So we can uh, just as well work with this and we'll get uh, property T uh, uh, for order of n. Okay, so let's uh, let, let me uh, describe the new method of proving property T. So it started with the result of Takao Zawa in 2014. Uh, and uh, here's how it works. So we start with the group ring and inside the group ring, we have uh, the Laplace. So the, the, inside the real group ring, uh, we will be working with the real group ring. So there is uh, the Laplacian element. And it's just defined as, uh, this is a non-normalized one. So it's just uh, the number of elements in the generating set, which is uh, denoted here by S, uh, minus the sum of the, uh, of the generators. Okay, so this is, this is uh, a discrete version of the Laplace uh, operator. And so what Taka proved is he proved that uh, you can actually use this element inside the group ring uh, to characterize property T. So he showed that uh, a group with, with the generating set S has property T. If there is a positive uh, constant lambda and a finite collection of elements from the grouping such that delta squared minus lambda delta is a sum of squares of these psi i's. Okay, so, the, uh, so this was very surprising. Uh, because it, it says that property T can be verified in finitely many dimensions. So in principle, this property that has so many applications and, and uh, uh, can tell you about vanishing of cohomology or rigidity properties uh, for group actions, for group algebras, it turns out that all you need to check this for this property actually happens on a finite subset of the group. Okay, so this, this was uh, quite surprising. So uh, in Taka's uh, original paper, he already, I think even in the abstract, he suggested that perhaps this opens uh, the possibility to try to prove property T for uh, classes, for new classes of groups uh, using computer assisted uh, methods. And, uh, and this is exactly what we're going to do. So, um, so how, how should we go about this? Okay, so, so let's start with uh, the sum of squares. So if I have uh, an element, eta, which is a sum of squares, I would like to be able to, to uh, translate it somehow. And uh, okay, so, so I'm going to assume uh, there's a finite subset such that all of these uh, psi i's are supported uh, on the subset E. Okay, and in everything that I'll be doing later, this subset always will be the ball of radius two in the group. 
Okay, and it's easy to, to notice that uh, eta being a sum of squares is the same. You can rewrite this in the form of, uh, in the following form that you uh, first choose, uh, a base, well, take up the elements, uh, enumerate the elements in the set E, the, the group elements, so these form the basis. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the condition becomes that uh, B, P, B transpose, where P is a certain positive definite matrix, uh, is equal to eta. And the reason is that, well, you can take the square root of, uh, of P, and then you can rewrite this whole equation in this form. And in this setting, the, the coefficients of Q will simply become, uh, uh, sorry, the columns of Q will become the coefficients of, of the, the i column of q will become the, the coefficients of the of the particular psi i. Okay, so so now we have a translation of this this notion into something that involves uh, positive definite matrices. Okay, so now the idea is to try to find the matrix P using a semi-definite solver. Okay, so we fix. Uh, so we're, the way it works is we, we fix a set in the group and we try to find, um, uh, we try to ask the solver to, to look, look for the matrix P on the given prescribed set. And then it might work, it might not work. It might happen that, uh, that in principle, it might happen that, uh, that one needs a larger set that we're not able to, to access, for instance, because it's too large. Uh, so what are um, what are uh, the issues that one runs into uh, here? So the first issue that in in this particular group one can run into is that the ball of radius two uh, in S O F five has four thousand six hundred uh, elements. Actually, a little bit more. Um, uh, however, the 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 thing is that this means that the matrix has over eleven million variables, which is far too large for uh, for any of these solvers to to uh, work with. Okay, so uh, so there's a way around it, uh, and I think Marek in his talk uh, later today will describe uh, this in in greater detail. Uh, so. Uh, there is a way to symmetrize uh, this this problem and reduce the number of variables. Okay, so first of all, we can take a certain uh, finite group that acts on the ball of radius two uh, in in S out of five, uh, and uh, it turns out that the whole problem can be uh, considered to be invariant under the action of this group. Okay, so this is just done by by averaging because the, the group is finite. Uh, so, so, okay, so, so then uh, you, once you do this, you, so you average, uh, you average the problem, and, but then you end up with matrices that are invariant with respect to some kind of group action, right? So these are matrices which are indexed by the sets E, so by the ball of radius two, and uh, uh, they will be constant on the matrix, on the orbits of the action of that finite group. Okay, so no solver can work with group invariant matrices once, uh, especially that the, the, this, you know, we cooked up this, this, this group and the group action for the particular problem we needed. So, so there is no solver that can work with, with, uh, with such uh, restrictions. However, there is another uh, theorem that we can use, with a classical theorem, which is the Wedderburn decomposition. And it turns out that uh, the algebra of these gamma invariant matrices, where gamma is this finite uh, subgroup, uh, can be uh, written as a direct sum, as a direct sum of uh, just matrix elements. Okay, so this is this is a classical uh, thing. Uh, so one thing that that is needed here is so 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 we need a uh, this isomorphism here to be uh, explicit because in the computation we actually need to go back and forth between the two uh, be, between the two uh, forms so the the invariant one and the 
um, the block uh, uh, the block matrices. Uh, so, so this can again be done. Uh, so in the end, so okay, so so you so you do this, and in the end, the solver gives uh, a positive definite matrix and some number such that this equation that uh, that we want it uh, to solve is uh, is solved. However, the problem is that this is of course a numerical solution, right? So we were looking for uh, for proof. So far, we only have an approximation. It's a pretty good approximation. Uh, the numbers that that uh, that uh, the accuracy was to the order of uh, of the order of ten to the minus ten, uh, but still, it's just an approximation. However, there is a little bit of magic that happens here, and there's a, a, a lemma that goes back to again Taka's first paper, and then it was quantified by uh, Nenser and Tom, and it says that this Laplacian. If you view it inside the augmentation ideal, so so it's an element in the augmentation ideal. If you if you look at the augmentation ideal and you look at self-adjoint elements inside the augmentation ideal, then uh, for those elements, the Laplacian is an order unit, which means that if you have a self-adjoint element in the augmentation ideal, if you add a sufficiently large multiple of the identity of the of the Laplacian then the sum becomes a sum of squares. So this is similar to how uh, identity behaves for matrices or operators. If you have a self-adjoint matrix operator, then the spectrum is in, in the real line. And if you add a sufficiently large multiple of the identity, you get a positive one, right? So, uh, so this is the same, but it's happening inside the augmentation ideal. And instead of the identity, we're using the Laplacian. Okay, so this is the same phenomenon. And uh, there is also uh, an estimate of what R do you actually need? What's the smallest uh, R that suffices? Okay, and it depends on the L1 norm of this eta and uh, on the support, on the size of the support. Okay, so how do you actually turn this into a proof now? So we have the approximate solution. I can rewrite this, right? So here nothing happened. I just uh, added zero, right? But here I had the error. I know that this is positive and here I have the error, right? So now to this part, I want to apply the lemma and maybe add some multiple of the Laplacian to, to see if I can turn this side to be, uh, this element to be positive. Okay, so I add epsilon times delta, and this epsilon will depend on this estimate here. And then this becomes a sum of squares. This is a sum of squares by definition. And here what I get is I get kappa minus this epsilon. <laughs> so if kappa minus epsilon is still positive, then it's all fine, right? So then I still have, solve my equation because I didn't really care about the constant. Uh, and uh, and, and I, I have the proof. So the idea here is basically that if I have an approximate solution and this epsilon, so, so the epsilon measures how large is the error. And uh, um, if the epsilon, so if the solution is sufficiently accurate and I can uh, make this epsilon sufficiently small and the kappa is sufficiently large with respect to this epsilon, then I'll get that next to the approximate solution, I have the existence of a true solution. Okay, so this is actually how it, how it worked. Uh, so data from the solver was the matrix P, lambda was 1.3. Here was the estimate on, uh, on the L1 norm. And it's important, uh, uh, I didn't mention this before, but it is important that the L1 norm here is computed in the interval interval arithmetic, okay? So this is what gives a rigorous proof. Uh, and and uh, yeah, so, the, so basically we have a, a, this epsilon that we need to choose or this R that we need to choose is 1.2, uh, sufficiently small that we get, that we easily, easily get a positive constant where we need it. 
Okay, so this is uh, th this process. I think Parikh will explain in more detail in his talk. Uh, and okay, so so I, I would like to say a few words about how how the general case is done because okay, so so with this method, uh, one can obviously do case by case, uh, right? So you take a group, you apply this procedure, and then uh, you either get the answer or you you don't. Um, and uh, however, what we have is we have a family of an infinite family of groups, right? So uh, in this by the natural numbers. Uh, and the question is, how can you actually uh, prove it for for the whole family if you're able to just do finitely many computations? So, uh, so maybe I'll just uh, go over this uh, fairly briefly. So, so um, uh, the the proof works for both classes of groups, or also for for S of n, but also for S and Z. So. These are generated either by Nielsen transformations or the elementary matrices. Okay, and these have very, both families have a very nice structure where they form a tower of inclusions where you just add a generator to the base group, right? So you either take Z to the power, to the next power. So this should be, this should be Z to the power N inside Z to the power N plus one. So you extend by the, by the next generator, either with the free group or with the uh, free abelian group. Uh, and then what I want to do is I want to look at uh, a simplex. So these generators are indexed by pairs of uh, 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 numbers from the set one through n. And uh, I'll use a simplex to visualize what's, what's, um, what's, being what's, what's happening here. But basically what I would like to do is in the simplex, the edges are, um, so I span a simplex on, on one through n, and the edges are, um, are, um, are given by pairs of uh, points. And so uh, I would like to assign to, to a given edge, I, I, I will assign all the generators that, are, that have the, those two indices, okay? So, so here's a picture, which will be much more informative. Okay, so this is this is for uh, for four. So here I have edge given by two and three, by the numbers two and three, and I have a copy of either S out of two or S L two, depending on which family I'm looking at, and this this is generated inside S out of four uh, by all the. Um, uh, by all the uh, elements with the uh, indices, all the generators with indices two and three, okay? And, uh, and I also have the same for, I, I have the same for every edge. And uh, also I have a little, so I have the Laplacian for the whole group, but I also have the Laplacian for the subgroup, right? So for each, to each edge, I have a small Laplacian for the subgroup associated. Uh, and, so there will be uh, different situations depending on whether uh, how how these edges are positioned, and uh, it's an important property that if the edges are in in the position uh, that we see here, so they're opposite, so they don't share any vertices, uh, then the corresponding copies of S out of two commute. Okay, so the generators commute. Okay. Okay, so if I start with the Laplacian uh, inside for, for my group S out of N, uh, then, then I have, I have these, these Laplacians for each edge. Uh, I also have the action of the alternating group. So the alternating group simply permutes the vertices. Um, and uh, and it also permutes the, the copies of the Laplacian. Okay, so the key thing is to now decompose the Laplacian in S odd of n into smaller pieces that are coming from the edges. So the first statement is that the Laplacian in S odd of n decomposes as a sum of the Laplacians over the edges. But you can also just fix one of the edges, use the action of the alternating group that permutes them, and 
just write it in this form. So it's the it's simply the normalized orbit, the sum of over the normalized orbit. Okay, so this is this is good, but uh, we know that S odd of two or SL two do not have properties, so we cannot really use those Laplacians that are attached to the edges because they come from SL two and S S odd of two. Uh, so what we should really do is relate the Laplacian on the level M to the Laplacian on the level N, right? And this is this is what happens because each one we can write using this formula, then we can also relate the two on dif any different two levels, M and N, okay? And these are the formulas. And the general idea is uh, that we will now decompose essentially the whole equation here in this fashion, that we will relate the equation on the level M to the equation on the level M. And knowing the solution on one level, we'll get the solution on any higher level. Okay, so, so this was for the Laplacian. Now we also need the Laplacian squared and uh, the Laplacian squared, this is the formula and it's, uh, this is over the sum of products over the edges. And then we have three different situations. So they either it's the same edge or they're adjacent or they're opposite. So we get three different parts here, the square part, the adjacent part and the opposite part. And, uh, the the square part and the opposite part are immediately uh, are automatically sums of squares. So for the squares, it's easy, it's obvious, and for the opposite part, it follows from the commutation, right? So the so the the opposite part uh, consists of products of Laplacian for edges that are, that don't have any uh, vertices in common. So the corresponding copies commute. And you can just rewrite uh, rewrite elements like this, which give you the Laplacian, and you can switch them around, and then you get sums of squares. So this means that the whole issue is inside the adjacent part. And maybe I uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll just say that there are formulas that uh, that relate all of these. So the adjacent part on the level M to the adjacent part on the level M. And so, so uh, also for the opposite parts. And uh, the, the main technical theorem uh, is that uh, if I have the adjacent part, if I can prove positivity of a certain element at a level N, then under certain assumptions, I can get positive, positivity for all, for infinitely many levels from some point on. Uh, just by by uh, applying these formulas uh, that decompose our equation into into smaller pieces. Um, yeah, so maybe I won't uh, I won't get into this uh, uh, further. This is this is the general idea. Maybe the one thing I, I'd like to uh, mention is that uh, a specific um, application of property T for odd f n is. Uh, to the product replacement algorithm. So the product replacement algorithm is an algorithm that uh, was uh, uh, created in the 90s. Uh, so it, uh, it's an algorithm that produces, once you have a finite group, it produces uh, uniformly distributed elements uh, within that finite group. Uh, so this is implemented in GAP and it's used, uh, uh, it's, it's widely used. Uh, so the interesting issue uh, when it was implemented uh, was that it uh, turned out to work extremely efficiently. So very quickly, you would get to a uniform distribution. Okay, so this was, it was unknown why, is, why this is the case. Uh, so in 2001, Lubotsky and Pak uh, showed that the explanation would be property T for autofam. And the reason is that they noticed that the algorithm, the way that it works, it's actually implemented by a random walk of odd of n on a finite group. Okay, so if you have property T, there is a uniform estimate on how these, these random walks converge to the uniform distribution. Okay, and, uh, and so, so this is what they proved. And so the, one of the consequences of, of property T for odd of n is that, uh, is that now this is explained. Um, uh, the, the, this explanation actually uh, holds. And the last thing is, is that uh, 
There's also uh, work that we're doing in higher cohomology where we uh, use similar methods and semi-definite programming to show uh, vanishing of higher cohomology. So we generalize uh, the this, uh, uh, this sum of squares approach to higher cohomology. Uh, and uh, Piotr Mizerka yesterday or two days ago uh, gave, a, gave a talk on on some results that we have for this uh, with this for SL reason. All right, I'll stop here. Thank you. Any questions? So, uh, so there is a proof um, by Mark Nietzsche. That's what he's a postdoc of Andreas Tom. Uh, so he has a uh, he, he he has a preprint with the case out of four, and he shows that it's uh, that it does have property T. Uh, so so uh, the the point is that he needed to go outside of the ball of radius two. We were not able to. Uh, so so he went a little bit outside. So you need actually a larger step. So in your algorithm, you put just a group. That the group has the property. Could you, for instance, show that it doesn't have? No, that's more difficult because then you need to exclude all the lambdas, right? So you have the equation delta squared minus lambda delta, mm -hmm. and lambda can be any positive constant. So you you need the you would need a method of excluding any positive constant. Which I I I don't I I thought about it. I don't see a a good way at this point of approaching. And uh, could you guess maybe there are some, uh, let's say, geometric properties of these groups, just, uh, you know, so called that you can guess that the group intuitively, that the group has a property T or it does? No, I would say it's quite difficult to. to uh, yes, in, in, in terms of ideal boundary or something. No, it, it, so for instance, there, so hyperbolic groups. Yeah. Among I them, think. among them, there are groups that don't have property T and ones that do have property. So it's it's quite difficult to somehow estimate which ones should have. Yeah. This, this was my question. Yeah. Hyperbolic yeah. So so there are known hyperbolic groups which do have it. Uh, uh, so they, it's not easy to construct them, right? So so you, so there is a it's a limiting process. So it's so you get a. So you have to take uh, uh, infinitely many quotients, and in the limit, you get a hyperbolic group that uh, that has property T. But on the other hand, you have the free group, which is hyperbolic and it doesn't have property. So, so again, it's it's uh, and some of these random groups uh, in the Gromov model they are hyperbolic and they have property. It's very difficult to say. So that there is no way to say just to be. Uh, no, other than some like this analogy between SLN and and mapping class groups or an auto fan. This was one way of sort of estimating which groups should have it. Yeah. But that's that's about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions? Where does the name come from? Property T. So this it comes from the. Uh, Definition of the time. So T is the trivial representation, and the uh, the parentheses should depict that it's the trivial representation is isolated in the delta box. Okay. okay, thank you very thank much. You. And we'll be Let me set up a screen for you and uh, yeah, yeah, it's not needed. Not needed. Yeah, probably. Just.